we're coming to the last talk of the day. I know it's hard to right before happy hour. Uh, my name is Adrian. I work at the Harvard Business School in our digital initiative. And this is Josh. He works for Reactive Studios. He's our developer on the open knowledge uh, classroom blogging project. So I just wanted to do a quick show of hands. How many people would consider themselves tech savvy? Okay, okay. So we'll gloss over some of the like, um, if we hit some jargon, I, I won't worry about it too much. And then how many people were at the three o'clock um, uh, talk with uh, Matt? Mike, thank you. No one. Oh, well that's great. Um, so Mike went over a lot of the stuff that we were going to cover, so we took a little bit of a pivot. So if it sounds a little off the cuff, uh, forgive us. And um, I hope that the pivot will actually be more informative for you in the end anyway. So, to begin, I think it might be helpful just to talk a little bit about what is open knowledge. Um, our goal is to make open knowledge the destination to create, share, discover, and engage in classroom discussions around business and leadership at, at HBS. That's a nice mission statement, but you know, what does it really mean? So it means that we're public. Uh, that means public facing versus open to the public, so everyone can see and participate in a limited capacity though HBS uh, community members have more access than the outside world. Uh, and why does that matter? Uh, mostly because blogging is becoming more of an integral part of the professional skill set. And we want to be sure that our students are getting introduced to that early uh, so they're better equipped in the future. So we're also scalable, which means scaling the tech, making it easy to spin up a blog using multi-site, but also in terms of network effects. Uh, the addition of new content helps everything on the system and gives everything kind of an SEO bump. Uh, and so we're also user driven. And that means talking to people, faculty, students, researchers, etc., to ensure that we're building product that meets their needs. And that's super important because user driven design is still fledgling, especially uh, in the academic community. And so prototyping the impact and success at HBS could change the way tools are built. And finally, we're community focused. So kind of as a case study of this user-driven design, at first, we hadn't considered um, building any community features into our blogging. We were like, okay, we need a blog. The faculty want to use it in the classroom. Case is done, right? But in the end, we, through user testing, we learned that there was an opportunity for students to interact with each other and with alumni and, recru and recruiters in a digital space that they weren't currently being served through existing HBS tools. So, what is open knowledge at a glance? Uh, we launched in six weeks at first. Uh, we had three courses at the MVP launch and six to date. Our large, largest course is nine discrete sections and 900 students and about 25,000 page views per month between all six blogs. So two of the six carry most of those and that's with any outside promotion. So this is about 80% organic search. So why did we choose blogs? Why are they public? Why not use Twitter or Facebook? Uh, why not just use an LMS that has kind of personal reflection tools? What's the big deal? And I think the next graphic will really help to illustrate that, which is that in post-course surveys, 97% of student respondents would recommend using public, tool, public blogging tools in another class. And that was a really surprising finding for us and for our IT and for the faculty. So what are some people saying? Open knowledge feels modern, relevant, and current. A professor told us that student blogging helped them to uncover new areas of research that they hadn't considered. Uh, some of the other things, an opportunity for students to experience public blogging in a supported environment, so seeing their classmates having help from them. The publicness actually increases the quality of the work because they know somebody other than the instructor is going to see it. And finally, it unearths potential research areas for professors. So now that I hopefully have gotten you a little excited about how you do this in the classroom, let's talk about who needs to be involved to make it a success. Uh, so it takes a village to raise a child, as they say, but who do you bring with you? So the stakeholder, an individual, group, or organization who may affect, be affected by, or perceive itself to be affected by a decision, activity, or outcome of a project. That's really nice, really lots of great jargon in there, but it's pretty vague, and before you know it, you get something like this which is a thousand people telling you a thousand different things and they all want them right now. But you as the project owner need to determine kind of who is gonna 
be the primary user for your project. Uh, and so we took more of a graduated path, bringing in less people to start with. So we started by asking ourselves, who's driving the bus? Right? In, at HBS, the faculty have the final word with respect to course design. So we got lucky because I'm part of a research initiative that's faculty driven. So our faculty chairs were our first pilot testers and they were also our biggest advocates to other faculty members. But your vibe mileage may vary. In general, determining the latest number, <laughs> sorry, the least number of people that need to play an active role will ensure the highest probability of success. So who are your users? Probably the faculty using the blogs in class, their students, their T the TAs, assistants, and anyone from the general public that might find their way onto the platform. That's still a lot of people, so from that list, who's the primary user? And in that case of the open knowledge, we determined it was the faculty. So now I'm going to talk through how you can hit the ground running um, using WordPress to uh, build your site. Uh, it's time to think about our implementation. So a great way to do this is a minimum viable product. And so Mike's talk earlier talked through some of these, um, how you can do a minimum viable product. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit of that. Uh, WordPress makes it pretty easy to get started that way. So uh, is anyone familiar with this graphic or seen this before? Um, so <laughs> basically this is showing um, how you build a minimum viable product if you're going to build a car. So the top row, um, if you are building a project piece by piece, you're going to start with a wheel, then maybe make another wheel, um, then maybe, maybe make four wheels. Um, and get up to the body, eventually you have a car. But during that whole process, you don't have something that people can use um, until you actually get to the end and you have that car. Um, whereas if you start with a minimum viable product, um, maybe a car isn't actually what your users want. Maybe what they need is a mode of transportation. So let's start with something smaller scale, something that's quick to build, and something you can get them using right away. So we can start with a skateboard. Um, they're able to get around with it. Um, and then maybe as, as they're using the skateboard uh, and they need to grow, they can love for the bike to a motorcycle, and then finally, if you decide that's actually what you need, you can build a car. Um, but this way you can get users in there and get their feedback right away and work that into your product rather than assuming this is what they want but spend all this time building this, building this product. And so you have to think about what's the absolute minimum um, project that you can build that allows your users to be successful. You have to strip down that feature set. Um, and so we need to think about how you define what a uh, working, working product is. Uh, and William Faulkner said, in writing, you must kill your darlings. And he's saying here that there are, these, there are these things that you really enjoy putting in your writing, but your audience may not care about. So there's something that you're really tied to. Um, so today we're saying, uh, in an MVP, you must kill your darlings. Um, and you need to ask yourself, if the feature absolutely must be included in that initial launch, and if not, um, you need to drop it. And so you need to stay focused, because um, you'll have these pet features coming up, uh, your darlings, that are the things that you really want, or even as you initially launch it to students, they'll have you like, oh, it'd be so cool if we can do this. And then you'll have to make a trade-off to implement those features. And so once you've determined your initial feature scope, um, you risk missing your deadline and not launching if you decide to build these other things. Um, once you launch and you get user feedback, you may decide that these really cool features may not even be something that users actually want. So it's really good to keep that uh, feature set as lean as possible. Um, so think about what tools do users uh, need to be successful. So um, we're going to talk through what our users needed and when they needed it. And the when aspect of that is really key because we launched uh, we launched this whole platform in six weeks, and so uh, we're going to walk through what what our uh, user types needed on day one of the platform and, and onward, and that helped us determine what we absolutely need to have done at launch. So on day one, uh, students didn't really need anything. Um, at that point, it was about the faculty. So faculty needed a site that looked like a blog. It didn't even have to be a blog. They just needed a site up, they needed a, a nice design, and the faculty and their support staff needed uh, accounts. So. On the first day of class, they're showing here, this is the site we're going to use for classroom blogging, but students actually aren't going to be interacting with it as well. So that's the minimum that we needed uh, to show up on day one. So then our next milestone was day seven. This was the course ad drop day. So at this point, we still didn't need anything for students, but this is the point where we actually had the final class list. 
um, any students that have added or, or dropped it. And so this is when we imported all the students uh, into that uh, into that site. Um, so they all got an email notifying that their account was created, but uh, they could go in and reset their password, but they didn't have to at this point. And then uh, the next big milestone, day 15, was the assignment submission day. So this is when the first assignment uh, was due on the site. So the instructor posts a, um, a prompt, and then the students all respond to the prompt with a public blog post. Um, so for here, we didn't need much for faculty, but for students, uh, they needed to be able to log in, they needed to be able to reset their password, they needed to submit their assignment. Um, they needed, part of their grade was also how they commented on other uh, students' posts. And we also needed to provide them customer support. So the, it's sort of a high-stress environment. Students are depending on the platform for their grades. This is how they're submitting their assignment. And the, the deadline is at midnight. Um, and so everyone's waiting to the last minute uh, to submit their assignment. And anyone who's having trouble, um, you know, needs help because this is really important to get their assignment in. So um, keep, keeping that student experience in mind was really important to ensure they had uh, success on the platform. So we had a help desk set up and were available during the assignment submission so that if anyone was having trouble resetting their password or submitting or anything, we were there. Um, and so even people that did encounter an issue had a good experience on the platform so we were able to quickly resolve their, their issues. Um, and then day 16 was the classroom discussion day. So this is when faculty tools made sense. So when, back on day one, we didn't launch with like any <coughs> exportability for assignment data or anything. Once the students submitted all their assignments, it's now the faculty's turn to go in and start grading and curating. So um, they would curate featured posts as they went through and say, this is something that we want to talk in class. So they'd be able to select that post. They had a separate classroom view that would hide the grades and everything and show this is what they could put up on the screen in front of their own class and choose those uh, uh, submissions as the day's discussion topics. Um, they also go through and grade them, and then they wanted to be able to pull down that, that grading data in CSV. So this is something that we didn't need these features on day one because they weren't going to be grading. So we were able to reprioritize these to implement these after the initial launch and make sure that they're there for um, the class discussion day. So being able to split up all these helped guide and reprioritize you know, what we were developing as part of our minimum five product. Um, and so what were the things that we cut out? So the first one was drafts and editing. So we built a blogging platform where you couldn't save a draft or edit your post after you submitted it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that sounds kind of crazy because that seems like a basic feature of a blogging platform. But this is, um, we didn't have a single student complain that they didn't have accessibility, which was really interesting it seems like a basic feature, but all of the post submission happens on the front end, and to meet our deadline, it was easier to ensure that students could submit, because that's all they really needed to do. Um, and then, of course, after the initial launch, we went back and implemented this right in the, in the next phase. Um, but that's an example of something that you might think is absolutely critical, but when it comes down to it, like, users didn't miss it. So it's something that we could implement after the fact. Uh, the next one was multi-site. So, um, we knew we were going to be launching multiple courses, and so multi-site would make sense because for the most part they'd be sharing the same code base. Um, and we knew there are potentially future features where we wanted to maybe cross-site search, um, maybe with one single site on between all the blogs. And, but it wasn't something that was absolutely necessary at site launch. And since we didn't have all those features um, known in the beginning, it was easier with our, with our time constraints to build each course on a separate site. Um, and so that's what we did. We didn't have to worry about any of the third party plugins and their compatibility with the site. We were able to keep it as simple as possible to get started. And so this is actually, um, last week, we migrate, finished our migration of all the single sites into multi-site. Um, and our original launch of this was last fall. So um, we did end up getting around to moving to multi-site, but it's something that we didn't have to do right for the initial launch. And then um, the last one, which this one is also similar to drafts, it's kind of funny that we don't have it, but right now the courses are one use only. So you can you can run a course and run the assignments for that section, and then um, that's it. So, so um, 
it's something that uh, a critical feature to be able to you know open a new session of the course and rerun the course for like the next semester. Um, but since we work, the course is working to be rerunning until the next year, we had an entire year to implement this. So it's something that was easy to take out of the scope from the initial launch. Um, and this is actually the current phase we're working on in preparation for uh, the next semester. So it's kind of funny that it's, a lot of these seem like, well, you absolutely need these, but we were able to launch without all these and still have the platform be successful. So make sure you challenge your assumptions when you're uh, deciding what absolutely has to be in there on day one. And so then after you launch, um, you can continue with iterative development. So now you have actual users using the platform. You can um, survey them, you can ask them what their needs are. They'll probably be giving you plenty of feature requests and bug reports. You can continue to test and see what works and what doesn't. And so that list of the, all the darlings that you killed at the beginning, the things that you really want, now you can look at those again and say, OK, these ones actually don't matter. Um, but these ones are even something new. Uh, this is what the students really so you can continue with that and continue uh, iterating, which is what we've done um, with the platform, where we're almost, finished, um, we're almost finished implementing those three things that I mentioned. So being a classroom setting and dealing with student data, we wanted to have a quick word on FERPA. If you work in higher ed, I'm sure you are very well familiar with the term. Um, and if this is you listening to this talk, thinking about what you're going to do with student data on the web, I just want to come and tell you, don't freak out. It's OK. Uh, actually, as it turns out, it's really easy to get past FERPA and into a wonderful, bulletproof place where you can have students put public data on the web. And it turns out that it's kind of a gray area whether or not FERPA actually applies to public student uh, posts. So, First and foremost, we implemented uh, the ability to use a pseudonym. So FERPA, if you're unfamiliar, um, requires that schools don't disclose private student data. And it was originally it was passed in like the 1930s to protect uh, students' parents from snooping on their on their grades and their um, on their work. So uh, in the now digital <coughs> age, it's kind of a weird gray area, but. Uh, we can get around it really easily by saying to a student, if you aren't comfortable pub publicly putting things online, use a pseudonym. Uh, so when a student first logs into the platform, they're required to set a display name, which can be their real name, and about 50% of students do choose to use their real name, uh, but the other 50% do use kind of uh, a handle of some kind when they're posting. Uh, and then the other option is to just offer alternative submission paths. So, uh, at HBS, we have a lot of students come that work either for uh, the Defense Department or for the Army uh, military, and there, there are a lot of cases where they're totally banned from interacting on social networks. Uh, and so offering those students a way to publish by email or to send in a written submission makes it a lot easier to make sure you're being inclusive of everybody in the class. Uh, oh, and finally, just don't ask for private data. So we had a great conversation with our um, InfoSec team at HBS, who was incredibly upset with us for not talking to them sooner. Uh, but they, they were under the impression that we were taking tons of private student data. And in the end, after they did a security audit, realized that the only things we were asking for were the name and email address of our HBS students. Uh, everything else was totally voluntary on their part. And even then, it was things like your LinkedIn uh, URL. So the less data you take, the less data you have to worry about. And we don't integrate with HBS's single sign-on on purpose because there's just too much to think about when you have to integrate with these really robust single sign-on networks. And in the end, students don't really have a problem logging into a second, uh, a second platform. Sorry. So finally, just want to say thank you, and I want to. Just make sure we take all your questions and help you get prepared if that's something that you want to do in your classroom. I have a question. Um, so my most recent experience is in like lower ed, more than higher ed. Um, and I guess it's more of a comment, but uh, the, the, one of the things that has been talked about a lot is like, the difference between the writing quality that a student does when they are submitting writing mm -hmm. versus when they're getting published, mm -hmm. right? And like, I'm curious to hear how maybe this changed the paradigm uh, from the teacher's perspective about like the quality of 
work that was submitted? You know, how much more engaged were students? Did they have better feedback from their classmates? Like all of that, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, if you came in late, uh, this is my favorite thing that came out of sur surveys. Like students love doing public work. Um, and the professors really love the work. So one of our professors said that it helped him uncover new areas of research. So the students were posting about like new uh, digital transformation and companies that have kind of weathered or not weathered the digital transformation. And he does a lot of work in that space. Uh, and so they are on top of all of these new kind of startups and things and as a professor that's not really what you're doing. Uh, so all of these blog posts really helped. And then we also heard that there was a significant increase in the quality of work from, from the student perspective because not only, I mean, at HBX there's also this kind of competitive thing of like if other people can see your work it better be very good work, right, because you're at HBS. Um, and so that helped things a lot. And then there was also the commenting piece of it which we thought was really funny because they people were required to comment and the instructor's fear was that you'd see all of these like, oh nice job comments, right? <laughs> but in, but really you got these robust, like they were almost blog posts in their own right because they the students cared so much about the work that other people were seeing on the platform, even if they're using a pseudonym. Yeah, um, We'll go, to, we'll go to green shirt in the back and then the Sure, green shirt. <laughs> um, I was looking at the description for this session. Yeah. And um, so I take it the gentleman was from Reactive. Josh, yes. Josh, and you were from HBS. I am. And you were creating a, a blogging tool called Open Knowledge. And is that based on WordPress? It is. It's a WordPress platform. It's built off of that. Can you talk a little bit more about how you moved from WordPress and what you had to do. I know there was um, there's been discussion so far. I wasn't here at the three o'clock with Mike that you referenced. Oh, that so. was fine. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So the parts we changed were merely talking about like how you go about building an MVP. Uh, the whole site is WordPress. So it's a now it's a WordPress multi-site instance. Before it was multiple single sites, but it's uh, it's a custom theme and a custom assignment plugin basically that we have, and that allows front-end submission of so none of the students. Or um, or commenters see like the WP admin. They don't see the back end of the site. Sure. So their whole experience is on the front end. Um, so, so that's what we built. And then along with that, there's curation and, and grading tools. So professors have these sep separate instructor tools um, while they're browsing the site. They can assign a grade and add notes. And that's also where they curate. So they say, okay, this is a this is a, this is a submission you want to talk about in class. And they, they click a button and it shows up on their um, their classroom. Show. So it's all it's all WordPress. Um, it's not it's not anything different, but it's um, just we use WordPress as like the, the base platform. To build when they stuff. showed the submissions, like the, I, that would be a student's input. Yeah. So and would it show their username, or did they take that out? There, so um, on the back end, yeah. we use so we have we take the class list from the registrar. Uh, so the youth, so the student's name and email address is taken from that list. Uh, so the faculty know who the students are by yeah. by real name. They yeah. can see their handle as well. Yeah. But um, but that that view is only seen by faculty and admins. The students and commenter level users don't see the name and email address. Okay, and just a couple small refinements. The um, was the entire course curriculum and student grading based on. The WordPress content, or did they actually have to hand in other projects typed? So we've seen actually a range. We've run in six classes so far. Uh, in some of the classes, and some of the more arguably successful classes, the blogging has been integrated mm. uh, with other assignments. And, and HBS runs on the case method, so there's a lot. Of, so there's the case method stuff happening. Uh, and then there are other classes that just kind of had blogging as a component, uh, and those were a little less successful because they weren't kind of thought about in a holistic way. It was just, oh, if you're doing class in this format, then you have to write a blog. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I saw one class that they tried to do the, um, the digital component on Facebook, uh, and it didn't end up working out because students didn't want to use their Facebook account for class. Yeah. Uh, and so they moved to Open Knowledge to do their final assignments. Okay. Yeah, so I, and I would say that if I were to give a suggestion based on what we've heard, figuring out how to integrate those posts. Um, like I really loved 
the couple classes that would, instead of a case, uh, go through and curate posts that they saw from the students and then talk about them in class. And students really love that too because they love having their stuff called out. Uh, I think over here on the side. Uh, I dug it up myself. I want to see some screenshots. Oh, okay, great. The actual courses. I, I... They're all public. So if you go to ok.hbs.org, um, you, can, you can be redirected to the, the courses that have run so far. Could you do that again? I'm not sure that's where I'm looking. There's a couple ways to get to it, but ok.hbs.org. Okay or okay. 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 Open knowledge. <laughs> um, in the back. So in one of the sessions uh, earlier this morning, we talked about getting students on in on the back end. Mm -hmm. It's just part of their um, formation and development. But I also recognize that depending on the size of the class, the level of students, you may not want them to have anything to do with the back end, right? Uh, and, and that's uh, one of the cases I'm in with my undergraduate first, like 100 level undergraduates. But I do want to publish their work, and I do publish their work. And right now what I do is, they use another, they use a LMS that has its own sort of blog piece, they'll right. do it in there. If I want to publish it or offer to publish it, I have them, uh, actually I have them work on a word draft, actually. Um, I have, excuse me, I have them do a draft in the CMS, then if they want to publish it, do a Word mm -hmm. file, and then I take the Word file and put it on my WordPress site. Is there a better piece than Word or something to make the sort of reporting process easier. Maybe to give them the feel of what it would be like to be on the back end, especially using dynamic media, like embedding a video mm -hmm. or something like that. Uh, and that also just makes it easier for me to put it into WordPress. I think um, Google Docs is probably a good like, like intermediary. That. Yeah, because you'll get, um, act, Google Docs is like scarily good at copy-pasting styles. So if you have them style like with H3s, which you can do inside of a Google Doc, and paste that into WordPress, it'll take all of that, um, all that markup with it, along with like embedding videos and things like that. Um, so that would be my recommendation. I would also look into uh, this group called Reclaim Hosting, which I think is just super neat and something that, in the long term, I would love. Uh, to see open knowledge integrate with, which is uh, a group of higher ed institutions that have basically tried to give every student a blog. Um, and so you start your course with your own blog, and then when you do an assignment, uh, you tag it with the assignment that you're doing, and it, you basically, like through an RSS kind of reader, pulls it up into the classroom blog. So what happens is that when you leave school, you still own your data, you still own the hosting, you still own the domain name, and so you can keep blogging, and you're already introduced to the whole process in that kind of supported academic environment. Um, but it also takes away a lot of those data, data governance questions that we're going to run into at HBS soon, too. And that's built off the of WordPress? Platform. Yeah, they have WordPress uh, integration. <coughs> So you talked about like going from proprietary LMS that has a blogging function into a word processing tool into WordPress, like a three-step thing. Um, there are a lot of what are considered like front-end publishing tools for WordPress, so plugins that work with WordPress that allow front-end user submission and that would allow you to just copy straight from your LMS and go straight into WordPress and then all you have to do is like checkbox yes, publish, and they can just skip the word processing need. Because like, like when we talk about accessibility a lot, right. like having Word <laughs> is an accessibility issue in and of itself, right? Using Microsoft should be on that list. Um, but even like Drive is great, but like what if you're that student who's trying to publish from, you know, a place with like really bad latency or something Absolutely, like that? Yeah. Like all of those issues would be kind of Yeah, yeah. I, I was. I guess I was. I think that's a great app. That's what we do for yeah. our student assignments. We're using the same WordPress post editor, but on the front end, um, we cut, we customize this. We're not using like an off the shelf plugin, but they just didn't work for our specific use case. But there are a lot out there that are that are easy to use as well. So that way, right. students don't have to understand how to use the back end of WordPress, and but there's still there's no transformation between what they write and what we show. Them. How is the broader user experience uh, feedback? Like, did you have a lot of feedback from students? It's amazing. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
We, yeah, so we do post-course surveys after every class, um, and we've gotten good feedback. I think, you know, there's obviously like a self-selection bias. Uh, the people who respond to the surveys are probably the most enthusiastic or least enthusiastic. Um, but we've also kind of tried to do one-on-one -on -one interviews as much as possible through each kind of, uh, each phase of development to make sure that the faculty and the students and the general public's a little bit much harder of an animal to wrangle right now, but making sure that we're definitely integrating along the way. I'm just trying to find some context. Um, the Harvard-MIT Open Courseware. Mm -hmm. um, how does your project relate to that? Completely separate, competing? Uh, can you say anything else about why you're doing this and um, the schools are doing that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So. My understanding of OpenCourseWare is that it's more of a MOOC style of anyone can come on and engage in a class. Um, this is a component of on-ground HBS classes. So HBS, even within the school, has their own MOOC, which is HBX. Um, and we will kind of, we're working on a strategy that integrates those as well. But this is more of like, what is what are the students in HBS learning, and what is the knowledge that they're sharing with the outside world, and then how is the outside world engaging with them? Yes. Uh, two part question. First is I know HBS is just one of many schools in Harvard. <laughs> it seems I'm a bit surprised that it was 12 years or so before the first. <laughs> What's the backstory on that and of other? As um, the first blog, you mean? Well this very conscious decision to bring bar blogging right into the education experience. Berkman, for example, has been around mm -hmm. X years. Have other schools, grad school design, um, education, have they been more exploratory than HBS? I know that the graduate school design uh, is on WordPress now. I don't know if they do classroom blogging. Um, I think at HBS specifically, business schools in general tend to be a little bit more conservative, uh, and that's a big reason why it took longer for HBS to sign on. Um, but I, I, you know, I honestly I couldn't say uh, with any kind of certainty why why now versus another time. Um, I know that other initiatives were started at HBS, like certain different. <laughs> things that were similar to what we're doing with open knowledge. Uh, and I think it sounds like from the interviews and conversations I've had with faculty and the admins, is it just couldn't get the right mix of um, administrative support and faculty buy-in uh, and just kind of resources, so. The second observation sort of builds on your question, which is that my experience with MIT breaking the boundary of the classroom is that it's much more messy. Mm -hmm. As I look at these, I wouldn't submit anything unless it could be published by the Harvard Business Review. Whereas the MIT channels, they use Slack, they use Facebook, they create their own MOOC backstories, there's Twitter feeds. And so you don't have to be publishable to contribute and move the thought stream forward. I think it's easy. Like, personally, I'm, I, I would subscribe to that methodology. Um, I think HBS, as an institution, uh, is, is much more of a polish first um, place. And so even getting them to the point of saying that they are comfortable with students releasing work into the public is a big move for them. Uh, and so, you know, it's, I think it's it's taking the institutions in the context with which they exist um, and, and saying like what is possible and what is unique for, for each one. How frequently were people publishing or submitting assignments or whatever? Did it depend on the class? Uh, yeah, it depended on the class. Um, the most I think we saw in one semester was four, four assignments, uh, but most of them were about one to two. Uh, and then we'll see how, how it develops as our feature set becomes a little bit more robust. Um, after the first year, you know, people didn't really use the platform more than what was required for class. Um, but there's a hypothesis that once we provide more kind of robust user networking, we'll see an increase in activity on the platform. Probably have time for like one more question.
Thank you guys so much for sticking by for the last talk of the day. Um,